go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will talk about data virtualization, separating myth from reality. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. So to do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen to activate that feature. And for questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our series speaker, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Hello, everyone. Always a pleasure to join these webinars. Um, and as you know, the topic today, as Shannon mentioned, was data virtualization and, and really what that means and, and kind of separating some of the myth and hype from reality. Uh, a question we always get um, is, will this be recorded? Um, will we be able to get the slides? Yes, and the good news is um, if this is the first time you've joined us, this is part of a regular series uh, that we have every month, and you can get all of the series from this year as well as all past years um, out on dataversity.net. So you can, if you're interested in any of those previous topics, uh, you can get them on demand. Um, and then if you're interested, we'd love you to join us in the last two of this calendar year um, that you can see coming up on kind of the different roles in data architecture. Uh, as well as a topic on graph databases, which is always popular. Um, but the reason we're here today <laughs> is data virtualization. Um, if you're familiar with that, um, I'd be curious, folks, um, as we, there's always a lot of active chats of how people are using that and people's experiences. Um, and I'll talk more about what that is, but really it's this idea of logically integrating data from different sources across the organization um, and without physically moving the data across. And so um, that sounds very cool. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of confusion sort of about what that means, what, how you can use it. Of course, vendors love to give their pitch. Um, it almost seems like magic. So I thought I'd demystify that a little bit um, and talk about what it is, what it means, some of the pros, some of the cons, and maybe some practical use cases. If this, if, if this is something that is new to you, maybe where you can fit it into your current architecture. Um, so what is data virtualization? I sort of covered that and we'll go more into that. But if you think of it as sort of this idea of a logical data layer where you can int integrate these different disparate data sources across the enterprise, but without physically moving the data. So we can talk more about that. Uh, but the idea is um, it doesn't necessarily replace a data warehouse or a database. Um, you can still integrate those. You could also, again, it doesn't replace um, a data lake, you can augment that as well. Another place this is uh, used often is if you have different types of data or external data feeds, a Bloomberg daily feed or weather or Twitter feeds uh, that are more kind of a real time. It doesn't really set, make sense to sort of move and locate. Uh, there's a lot of reasons you wouldn't want to move the data. Maybe you're just doing kind of a, a test case um, and kind of understand uh, that kind of full data fabric as someone mentioned. <laughs> um, so. On top of that, you will have the query or reporting layer. So you can use your BI tools, you can use a good old fashioned Excel spreadsheet, you can just write SQL. Um, but it's that kind of interim layer there that is kind of that um, virtualization <laughs> layer be between that. So um, uh, I always like to go uh, to Gartner for they have very good definitions generally. Um, they go a little more detailed in terms of their definition of data virtualization where um, not only the logical views, um, but a little bit more of whether that's sort of cached um, on that server layer and whether or not you define, redefine the source data or not. So data virtualization, and we'll go more into that, it isn't magic. There generally is some sort of server or tool that manages a lot of that caching um, 
work. And it doesn't always mean, especially now that these tools have come a long way, that you don't do any redefinition or, or changing or quality on that data. It isn't necessarily just taking it from one place and moving it across. So um, that's from a report uh, that's referenced there, if you want to go see the full uh, report, that's always interesting. Another report we can refer to, and it is hot off the presses, I think just last week. Um, so you may be familiar, we do a report, or I, I guess it's been, oh, I'm old, four or five years now. We do sort of an annual report with data diversity on trends in data management or trends in data architecture. And I thought this was interesting. I hear a lot about data virtualization. And again, I'd be curious in the chat, people who are using it, hear about it a lot, a lot of questions about it. But when you actually look at the numbers, and this, again, these are data diversity audience, so folks like you on the call, um, it's one of the lowest ad 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 uh, adoptions of, of any of the technologies out there. So no surprise that BI data warehousing is, is, is really high. Um, uh, but data virtualization was low. You'll also see this year we did something a little different. We compared uh, the 2020 um, findings with 2019. Uh, 2020 is odd. <laughs> so I don't know. We can take a bit of that with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, you'll see that even between last year and this year, it's gone down significantly. So nearly 30%. So we did notice across everything, if you look between uh, 2019 and 2020, almost everything went down except for the tried and true BI data warehousing security governance type things. So if you read the report, we have our thoughts, um, you know, is, is it people going back to security a bit? Tried and true, we don't have a lot of extra time budget bandwidth to be doing some of the exploration. And so when there's sort of crisis, people go that back to the kind of the you know, the, the core value propositions, that could be it. Um, but again, it's 2020, so who knows? But even without 2020, uh, data virtualization has been sort of low across the board. Uh, again, I hear a lot of, about it. I get a lot of questions about it. A lot of the vendors tout it a lot. I, I know in our practice, I mean, we have used it. It's not a big part of, of what a lot of our customers are asking for. That said, it is. Um, there's a lot of talk about it. Notably, again, going um, back to Gartner, um, they admitted as well that current adoption is low. In fact, their numbers in 2011 was only 11%, about 40% up in um, 2018, so they're seeing an increase. And they expect a much larger increase throughout 2022. So the, their estimate is up to 60% of enterprises would, would implement some sort of data and, um, virtualization as um, one option for data integration. And I like that they sort of call that out and I will talk about that more. If you've heard me present in the past, I, I do my little old lady rant about the whole either or, right? Just because there's virtualization doesn't mean data warehousing goes away or data lakes go away or ETL goes away, right? It's another tool in the toolkit and being able to use it effectively, um, it can have a lot of, a lot of benefit. So a, a little bit more about it. So. What is that difference between just, to, I mentioned things like ETL and data warehousing and comparing that to data virtualization. So what, what are some of the key differences? So it, I, I would assume a lot of people on the call are familiar with more of the traditional data warehousing approach where you have your source systems, typically, uh, you know, database systems or even spreadsheets, uh, you would tr extract, transform, and load that. So you're not only moving the data, but typically you're doing transformation on it. It could be as simple as data cleansing. It could be uh, summarization for more historical trending in a data warehouse. But there's definitely physical movement from the systems into the warehouse. A lot of great reasons for that, right? You do often want that single source of truth. Again, we, we saw in the data diversity report, um, I'm seeing it in our practice that, wow, more than ever, people are looking for a data warehouse. Those companies are looking to be more data-driven. That, that use case doesn't go away. Um, and then generally, because, uh, you know, folks in this call probably are, da are data experts, but not every person who wants to look at a report is, but there is this need for self-service. So a common way to add that usability as well as sort of we often call a semantic layer you know, the usability, what, what the data means, maybe business-friendly terminology instead of calling it table and column names, we might build a cube or sort of a semantic layer, which sits between that warehouse 
in the BI reporting layer that isn't a virtualization layer, but in a lot of ways it's similar. It's a kind of a layer between the end user and the data itself. Now, if we want to compare that picture um, to data virtualization, um, here you still have the source systems, but the data stays there. And that's where that virtualization layer can sit between the end user and the, and the source systems for that BI reporting. Uh, so in a lot of ways that's similar. And I, I've heard some you know, confusion about some of these, you know, how, how it's different and how it really is the same. The other nice thing about data virtualization, separate from something like a data warehouse, um, it is you can have a bit more diversity in your systems easy, more easily um, because, the, again, the data stays in place. You're not trying to conform that to a database structure, um, which, again, has its pros and cons. But, yeah, I'm trying to get a daily external feed for weather and have that in my portal um, or, again, a market trend, you know, stock market closing trends or weather and things like that. Um, integrating cloud and on-prem, you can do through that data virtualization, ERP system, CRM. And you can see that definitely the benefit there, but you can also see where that can start to sound like magic, right? <laughs> Take anything and just sort of magically put this layer um, across it and magic happens. As we know, there is no magic. That's why we all, <laughs> well, it's, it's lucrative to be in data management because there is hard stuff underneath that. Um, so I thought I'd go through some of these and show some of the differences and similarities between things we may be familiar with. So data virtualization versus ETL, and I don't mean versus versus like one, you know, fighting across each other. <laughs> Again, that's, that's one of my pet peeves in, in, in technologies that we sort of, it's either one or the other when there's often, you can see at the bottom, these, these two solutions can complement each other in an organization. It just absolutely does not need to be an either or, but there are differences. So. And ETL, again, um, extract, transform, and load. When you do want to physically move the data, this is sort of the tried and true workhorse to do that. So if you are doing sort of that enterprise-grade effort where you do want this planning enforcement of the rules, you do want that, it's going to be the, the same over time, something like a warehouse, and there's other use cases for ETL, obviously. Um, but if we just use the warehouse as a very common one as a kind of comparison to data virtualization, I, I do want to do that upfront planning. It is rigid, it is locked in, and I, you know, I probably want to do it nightly, weekly, monthly, depending on my needs, um, so that I can really do that processing and transformation. It can help with some of the, you know, aggregation and, and cleansing and things like that. Now, with data virtualization, it doesn't always make. I mean, it's it's expensive and it's you know time consuming. There are resources needed to move that data, so that is not always practical. Another use case for it is if you do just want a rapid prototype, right? I'm, I'm doing a POC. I'm not sure even the, you know, efficacy of this data. Does it make sense to integrate it? I just want to really get an idea of what this data looks like. I don't I want to have to build an entire data warehouse to get some results. Data virtualization is very good for that. Also, when you, you, you're not in that data warehousing sort of batch, understand, aggregate, load, verify, et cetera, you really want those near real time. Maybe you want, again, it's not an either or, you have your data warehouse and you want to have some of those streaming things come in and kind of join it with other areas. Um, so it really is sort of delegating the queries and joins and aggregations more to the source system and then it returns the rows. So again, you're not moving the data and then sort of transforming it, you're keeping the data in place. It is really that difference between ETL, which moves it and virtualization that does not. Um, so, We'll cover a little bit, talk more about that. But uh, the other kind of similar yet different uh, aspect of this is the, the kind of that user layer or the, we're calling the virtualization layer. In a lot of ways, um, there it's similar to what you might have by a BIQ because it's that layer that allows you to query it across. Um, one of the nice things about a, a business intelligence cube, um, it is almost by definition easily understandable by business users. It kind of adds that user friendly semantic layer, um, you kind of organize that data in a way to slice and dice. You know, I want sales by region, I want sales by day versus week versus month, right? And it's sort of not only is structured in a way to kind of slice and dice, but it's generally in the tool itself um, and people can use it. But that's also a negative. You're sort of locking into a tool because you've built all of those BI cubes in that tool. And um, that might be fine. Maybe you've standardized, but then, you know, if you want to move that, then that doesn't always nicely translate, right? So one of the benefits of a data virtualization layer is that it can be used across these multiple BI tools. So you sort of, you know, 
avoid some of that vendor lock-in. Um, but on the flip side, it is more of a SQL query layer. So, you know, more and more business users are knowing SQL. It's not, you know, it's it's complicated. It's not brain surgery. Right? It's something that someone with, you know, fairly technical skills can, can take on. Um, but a lot of business users don't want to, or that's not something that we would expect to see from a business user. Um, it is a good solution for your data scientists, your BI developers. Again, think of that rapid prototyping or I'm trying to get a, a large view across the organization. Um, that's sort of where data virtualization fits in. And again, it doesn't have to be an either or. They can comp complement each other. They each have their use case. But I know I, I called this one out. And one thing I try to add in these webinars each month is a little bit of real world <laughs> experience. The stars you can't see at the moment, but they're there from all of the, the different uh, projects we've done. Um, and I do get this question a lot in terms of if we're trying to kind of have more and more, we're trying to, the word data fabric sort of came up. I mean, one of the questions, you know, that, that ecosystem of tools um, and also a, um, a, a way to easily aggregate the data for, for con consuming across the organization. So kind of that data virtualization comes in. Um, I, I see uh, one of the questions on, you know, does the data virtualization tools provide a semantic layer? Yes. A lot of them have come a long way. Kind of in the day, a lot of, it was a lot about just that virtualization, right? Um, as, they, as they progress, um, it isn't magic. And one of the reasons I put this in, um, I had a, a colleague, and he was a technical colleague. He's actually in the industry with data management as a consultant. Um, and he was a fan of virtualization, but he, he would always say, it doesn't matter. It, they just do it. It's, it's just, you know, it just works. And I don't know about you, but if I, uh, <laughs> whenever I hear that as a tech person, it makes me very, very nervous. Nothing just works, right? So what is behind the curtain of data virtualization? Again, a lot of these, uh, there are platforms, either a lot of the data integration vendors uh, have one of the tools in their toolkit to be a data virtualization layer. There are some um, pure play data virtualization vendors out there, fewer and fewer. They seem to have been kind of um, gobbled up by the by the data integration vendors because this is a nice fit to augment some of the other solutions out there. So what they offer, and they're coming a long way, and if you kind of track these vendors, again, the line blurs with so many technologies now. I mean, one of the things they will offer is query optimization, and that's some of the part that isn't magic, right? I mean, there is there is query, there's performance, there's things you need to do to get that data back. That absolutely isn't ma magic. Um, but they are also adding things in addition to just that infrastructure and federation and that, you know, how do you manage the mood of moving of the data? Um, things like data quality, um, a semantic layer, a data catalog often. Um, so everyone is in the catalog game now, right? um, but understanding that um, that semantic layer um, as well as some data governance functionality. Uh, that I think that was something in the past, again, that anything that's easy sort of screams I can get around governance, right? So um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, it doesn't, you know, preclude the um, need to actually um, do some of this hard work as well. So, um, in fact, I would argue things like data governance might be even more important as you're looking if we jump back. Um, all of these disparate sources, you know, who's the data owner, what's the data privacy, um, you know, all of those, when you have it sort of locked down in a warehouse, um, it's a little easier to kind of control and manage that. But now that you know, you're distributing it, right? So do we have good data stewardship? Do we know what that data means in the provenance? So that's why I think more and more, um, a lot of data virtualization tools are touting the fact that they do not only have governance, but they have security and they have almost full data catalogs or they're a data integration tool that kind of works with some of their other pieces that offer some of this as well. Um, so it absolutely does not obviate the need for that. I think actually it sort of um, enhances that. Um, so what it is not is an easy way out of doing the hard work of data modeling, data quality, data governance, and, and stewardship, um, et cetera. I mean, you need to understand what data you're moving. That doesn't magically happen. You don't just sort of point to the area and let that go. If your data quality is not good, um, I mean, data quality is a whole 
topic in and of itself, right? So I'm a fan of fixing it at the source. So ideally, um, the source systems have good data quality. I'm not a fan of using ETL or, or to fix it unless you absolutely have to. Um, but that is a consideration and understanding your source systems. Governance and stewardship, I mentioned. Who is the steward of that data? How do we manage it? It absolutely doesn't matter if the data is – if it's moved to one place, if it's staying at the source, there still is a data steward. There's still privacy and security. There's still HIPAA rules. There's still, um, you know, the data meaning. Um, and I would say even more so getting that involved in that. And again, any technology that can seem simple sort of goes to it. And again, that, that, that's often a good case for it. I'm just doing a prototype. Um, so let's do that as well. Um, master and reference data is another one. I mean, there's a whole webinar on that, right? Uh, there's different methods of mastering. So could you kind of have a log logical, you know, there's that data by logical warehouse. Can you have sort of logical master data where it either sort of lives across source systems with this data virtualization layer? I would say I'm not a fan of, of that, that uh, it would take a lot of orchestration. And generally the idea of master data is that it's sort of a centralized area that can, yes, be cascaded across, I personally am happy in the chat for anyone to disagree with me because that's what's um, helpful about these webinars. Um, I think sometimes when people are looking to do too much of virtualization or distributed of master data, they're kind of not mastering it, right? I want a single review of my products or my countries or my, you know, codes. Um, probably good to have that in, in one place. That said, it can be a source for data virtualization as well. Um, so not an easy way of, of doing the hard work, just another method of kind of uh, integrating that data. Um, moving along, um, so some of the use cases, again, it, it can be a great way uh, to integrate with uh, disparate data sources. It's great for sort of real-time data access, uh, rapid prototyping, doing some data exploration of the sources, right? So, so in some cases, it's sort of a precursor to your data warehouse. Um, does this even make sense? Um, uh, really that nice way to kind of have a virtual layer across, and again, it's not an either or, they complement each other. Um, but I would say, and again, open to, uh, to uh, folks disagreeing with me, not a great for a, a centralized data warehouse or master data management reference data, I kind of put in a similar area. I mean, graph databases, um, it, it can, what, what can be sort of confusing is that it can manage a lot of these different systems like documents, but I wouldn't say it's a document management system, right? So I think if you want sort of a broad view across these areas, it's a great way to understand that information. If I want to pure play, do true document management with taxonomies and, and all of that, versioning lifecycle, you know, that, again, that's where a great use case is that it would live in its source, but when you're trying to integrate, you just kind of have that virtual layer across it. Um, so, um, I have gone much faster than I usually do. So <laughs> Shannon's going to kill me. <laughs> we are actually getting close to time. So um, in summary, um, when we look at data virtualization, it is, you know, that flexible way to integrate the disparate systems without moving it. While current adoption is low, I think expectations are high. That said, um, a little bit of, um, I don't know, they've been sort of saying that for a while. <laughs> so, um, but again, things change and adaptation changes. I know Gartner is one where they are really expecting big things for data virtualization. I know it, it is a great tool in the toolkit, um, but it does not obviate the need for strong data governance, security, and things like that. Um, and it can be definitely be a complementary technology to other data warehouse solutions. So one um, point I wanted to make when I mentioned uh, the survey, um, this is a has a lot of great information, not only about data virtualization, but trends in general. Um, and that is available on the Dataversity site. Again, I think it's just a week hot off the presses. So it's free for download. I think uh, Shannon usually puts out a link in the follow-up email that you'll get in a few days. Um, and you can kind of see a lot of other trends that we've kind of talked about as well. Uh, we do this for a living, so if you'd like help, let us know. Um, and then, as always, I'm going to pass it back uh, to Shannon if you wanted to open it up for questions.
Oh, before I do that, sorry. Um, next month is on the topic of kind of that difference of terminology matters, right? What's a data architect versus a data engineer versus a data modeler? Always hot question of what is there overlap? What's the difference? So if you're, if you're available October 22nd, please join us for that. So without further ado, Shannon, I'll pass it back to you for questions. Donna, thank you so much for this presentation. And we do have a lot of great questions coming in. So we got lots of time to get to those. Um, and if you do have questions for Donna, please submit them in the bottom right hand corner in the Q&A portion of the screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. And of course, a link to the paper along with anything else requested throughout. So diving in here, Donna, you know, with the magnitude of teleworking uh, occurring, it would seem that data management related issues would be of high priority, yet slide seven showed a marked uh, decrease in all aspects of the survey. Why was this the case? Yeah, I I found this one. I'll go back to that survey that the person is asking. Um, it was it, I found this one very interesting because this is the year of you know for anyone listening to this after the fact, 2020 was sort of the COVID lockdown, um, and so this survey was sort of right after that. Um, so yeah, you would think I know in our practice we're seeing an increase in a lot of demand um, for you know the the for data analytics, for people working remotely, understanding data, um, data digital transformation, all of that. Um, so, I mean, what we, I'm thinking, again, I think a lot of people are still doing data management. I don't think data management's ever going to go away. Great, great career to be in. But again, when things are risky, I think people have to go to the core. I think um, there's a lot of exploration out there. I think a lot of people want to look at things like new technologies, right? Um, but when we absolutely have to cut to the core, the good news is that we're cutting to the core, and I'm seeing this, we need to understand our business, we need to be more data driven. Where should we, you know, where should we cut costs, where should we expand our business? That's almost a prime use case for business intelligence and data warehousing. And data governance, of course, and security is going to be with telework and things like that. Security is of massive importance. I know there have been some you know, issues around that. So. Um, only, only the survey participants know, but my, my theory is that of that it's not that data is important, but people really have to cut to the core fundamentals. And I bet, um, you know, in future years when people have a little more budget and, and, and less of a crisis mode, we'll go back to some of the exploration. Um, so that's sort of my theory, but if anyone else who maybe even took the survey and, and, and was one of those that kind of went down, I'd be curious if anyone had it in the chat. So that's a good question. Yeah, so a one-year real-time for data virtualization, uh, it should be real-time which supports getting data from message queues? Yeah, real-time is one of those words uh, that has so much meaning. So, I mean, I guess literally I would think real-time, I think of real-time, sort of you're, you're doing uh, – you know, split second stock trading and things like that. There is generally a, a bit of a lag. Often there still is some transformation. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 it's not like there's a lag of days, right? So I guess it, one person's real time is another person's near real time. Um, I, I'm finding that word used more and more. In fact, I find it interesting. Again, we've been doing a lot of BI and data warehousing again. Um, and a lot of the users will say, I, I need it, I need it real time. And, and some of the things were sort of annual reports, monthly finances. And I said, real time. I was really trying to get my brain around what real time meant for something like a, a, a monthly uh, sales report. And they said, no, 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 I want the report when I want it. I want to go to the BI tool and have it real time. <laughs> and that is absolutely not what I meant by real time. I would think the data is real time. They meant accessing the data when they wanted it. And so, sort of the Netflix version of getting your data. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it, I think of real time as literally there's a bit of a lag, and uh, yeah, that's, that's my definition of it. But open to other people's chat. I like it. Uh, so, if you delegate join compute to the or system, are you not in contention with resources on an operational system? It could be, yeah. That's why I think um, that idea of of well, let me go back to. Let me go back to the picture of it's not magic behind the court curtain. So this whole idea of the query optimization is important, and that's where it's not 
magic. So um, I think you do, it is still um, an issue to consider. It doesn't change the discussion, it moves the discussion, right? And so that could be definitely be a con of maybe you don't want to keep it in the source system and um, and that's maybe why for a production data warehouse, you do move it. I mean, that is one of the um, one-on-ones around data warehousing when you're trying to report off the operational system. Many reasons to do a warehouse, but one is that you're not contending with an operational system. So yes, definitely something to consider. Um, it doesn't get rid of these things, it moves it, right? So uh, that, that good, good question there. I saw and one, I'm sorry, I'm going to pre-answer. Someone was asking about kind of life cycle management and dev test production. Does that go away? It absolutely doesn't. And you'll see this box here as well, that a lot of these virtualization layers um, can, can manage that as well. Um, some people do use this for sandbox, right? Because I am, it, it is a great first kind of brush of I, before let's go into all of the effort to move or get your servers and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, if you have this tool, it, it can be sort of a, a dev type uh, prototype, um, but if you do have it in production, I don't think dev test in production go away. Um, so definitely look for your vendor that can support that when you get one of these platforms. Uh, so I can, data virtualization can be organized for self-service by business users, and most of the data virtualization provides uh, declarative and drag and drop features for people having some Excel knowledge. Um, how matured are those uh, data virtualization tools in uh, are providing a true data quality solution? Um, data quality is uh, is really ho holistic. I, I have, well, what's difficult about that in any of these tools is often the vendors who have uh, virtualization also have kind of pure play data quality as well. Um, I think uh, it's clearly a robust data quality tool on a, of its own, um, it, it, can, it can always do a better I mean, I kind of like the data, I, I might be showing my bias. If, if data quality and true reconciliation and all of that is the main use case, I would lean more towards that data warehouse because partly that real time doesn't give you that idea. You can do some sort of um, rule-based data quality, but say if you do need a human in the loop verification, or you know a lot of data quality is holistic so some pure you know data quality checks or some formatting and things like that i, I think you can do but i think if you really do need you know what do you call it uh, validated financial statements and things like that or uh, some of my healthcare clients when they're doing either mdm or uh, even data warehousing they they do have a human data steward due to the just the sensitivity and risk if any of that data is wrong and you just that, that typically doesn't lead to a data virtualization style approach. So I think if data quality is a massive concern, um, I would kind of lean towards some of the others, but again, open to other people's views there. And to extend on that, also most of the data virtualization solution enables faster time to deploy data as a service for application modernization as part of a digital initiative. Do you agree with that? I think that's fair. Yeah, I think, um, I think I as well. If, if we're just rapid time to deploy, but with the risk associated, right? So do, you know, just make sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I I think rapid prototyping doesn't mean it would go away, but that's where your dev test and prod would come in. Um, yeah, I just always get ner nervous when we go too rapid, but that that is one of the benefits of this. I need something fast. I don't, you know, I, I want to do just enough. Uh, sort of quality and integration and things like that, it absolutely can be a nice kind of way to quickly join this information. And it may be your permanent way, right? Because, you know, if you give this example, you may already have, uh, oh, I had the example earlier. I mean, you may already have a data warehouse and you want to augment with that. Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't exclude that. You can then integrate that with other systems without having to hold the build the layer. So yes, it definitely can speed time to market, and that's one of the main use cases and why why it's kind of appealing to people. So Donna, is data virtualization appropriate interim solution for a long term migration project? I want to present a harmonized view in the new system of reference data contained in the old system that is spread out through disparate siloed data sources. 
I think so. I think that's, uh, um, again, kind of this rapid prototyping or you know, before you uh, want, want to actually move the data to do all of the work and you really just want to do kind of that sandboxing or, uh, yeah, exploration, um, I think data virtualization could be a very powerful tool for that. So, again, some, it may stay as a long-term solution depending on the use case and the type of data, or you may know that, yes, I need to do a more robust warehouse down the road, but for now, let's just do some initial joins and queries and things like that. It can be a very powerful way to do that. So, yeah, definitely a good use case for that. And can data virtualization be used for building cloud-based enterprise data warehouse on data lakes supported by uh, computer clusters? Um, yeah, cloud is definitely a solution. I think the other part of, of whether, I think a cloud data warehouse doesn't necessarily need virtualization. I think those, I see those as two separate questions, uh, but it definitely can support cloud and it definitely can integrate with a warehouse. Um, there's this idea of kind of a virtual warehouse, and that could be kind of this idea that you're integrating things together. You could do cloud and on-prem as well. Um, and again, just make sure that, you know, there is this complexity behind the curtain of kind of, the, again, that query optimization doesn't go away. A lot of these tools have come a long way, and with each release, they, they do really manage some of that uh, contention and things like that better, but it's still an issue. Um, so, yeah, the cloud is definitely something that it can support. Um, and I believe almost all um, BI reporting tools have a presentation layer and can you do can do virtualization as called a data virtualization layer. What do you think? Um, I would, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't know if that would be a pure virtualization. I mean, yeah, I, uh, I mean, you can have something like a Power BI and you can have a cube onto your uh, relational data. You can also um, bring in, you know, some of these, ex you know, I can get Google Maps and kind of overlay onto that. You can kind of link to things. I see that as different than a data virtualization layer. It's more, I mean, some of those you bring the data in. Uh, data virtualization more is you would kind of do those it's really that whole ecosystem of tools. I think, I mean, in a lightweight way, you could kind of say that's virtualization. I kind of see that as just kind of linking data from a bunch of different places, <laughs> I guess. Maybe it's data virtualization light. Um, but, yeah, I guess, I mean, you could, and we have uh, customers doing that now where you've got kind of your warehouse data and then you bring in, you know, some weather data or map data or things like that um, onto that tool. But I think that's a slightly different use case than pure data virtualization with, you know, the security layer and the query optimization and, and a lot of, sort of that as well, so. And if you have additional questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. Um, I do see some comments here. I'm trying to go to the chat here. Just, I see some questions that have come in throughout the, um, on the, in the chat. Um, uh, but most data, do, most data virtualization tools provide a semantic layer? A lot of them do, um, yeah. And I think, you know, I, I kind of said when I was comparing the cube um, with data virtualization, I mean, a cube has a semantic layer. That's another one of those terms that's there's a lot of different semantics around. Um, but more and more the data virtualization tools can have that. They often have data catalogs. They often have some light data governance as well. Um, so that definitely can be in place, um, yeah. I saw another how question. Does, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So how does data virtualization layer address historical data persistence, for example, type 2 dimension historical tracking? See, I would think, and again, people can, I, I think once you're doing that, that seems to make much more sense to be in your, your data warehouse. I mean, to me, that's almost a prime use case for, I want to, you know, ETL it over and I want to kind of do my faction dimensions and slowly changing dimensions and things like that. Um, makes a lot more sense and you do want to have that kind of stored that history over time that use case to me is much more of a kind of traditional data warehouse again you could keep that data warehouse and then use the data virtualization layer to integrate that with other data. But i think if you're truly doing that kind of consolidation and trending and cleaning all the things you need to do that that to me feels like more like something to put 
Uh, speaking of, uh, oh, you actually got to that question quite a bit. <laughs> so we'll skip that <laughs> in time. Uh, I saw too much of can jump in because I think it's related. Um, someone had a question about Data Vault. Um, so if you're familiar with Data Vault, this is sort of another kind of a agile way to do some data warehousing. Um, and could you use it over a data vault? Yeah, yes. I, I wouldn't, again, like the warehouse, I wouldn't see that as a replacement for a data vault. Um, but a data vault database or data set uh, definitely could be as one of the sources for the state of virtualization layer. I have personally not done that, um, but I don't see any reason why that couldn't be done. That seems like it makes sense. So Donna, if you delegate join compute to the source system, are you not in contention with resources on an operational system? Yes. Yep. Yep. I think that is one of the risks. And again, like in this picture, that is one of the reasons why you might want to do a warehouse. One of the reasons for a warehouse, but one is to take that contention off of the source system. So again, that that is one of the considerations uh, when you're you, again these, these this magic box. And maybe I got too sensitive about that. A colleague, we kept saying, don't worry about it, they just fixed it. Well, there's never a they, right? So there is query optimization. Where that query optimization occurs it is not a trivial thing. So, yes, you do need to consider that, and it isn't necessarily magic. Um, so you need to kind of think that through. And Donna, what do you think about the new concept of a data hub? A data hub is one of those overused words, so everyone has a different uh, definition of it. Um, I do have several customers using it very successfully. I, I yeah, yes, it can be this idea of, um, you know, uh, you have hubs, I, the one that, I have one customer is an international customer where they had a very successful, kind of had their customer hub and their product hub, and then, that was sort of a loose, uh, someone had a question about the data fabric. <laughs> it was much more, it wasn't, you had this one central warehouse. They sort of had various data hubs that were sort of loosely integrated with more of a data fabric approach. And it was very, very successful. And it sort of um, broke things out. So that it, it, I'm seeing more and more people go kind of more toward the data hub approach. It's another tool in the toolkit. And, and so, so why don't you recommend to use their data virtualization to master data management? Um, I I think I think I think <laughs> I say that I think three times in a row. I'm a fan of a centralized data, uh, a centralized approach for master data and reference data, right? So reference data as a good example, I want to list my country codes. I just want to list my country codes and I kind of, I sort of do want in that one place. It doesn't mean, I mean, there's a publish and subscribe model for MDM. Um, so it doesn't mean that that data has to stay in that place. I can have my MDM quote hub and have, or reference data hub and have that pushed out. So that's reference data. Maybe that's a little easier, and maybe that wasn't the question. You know, yes, to have one table with a list of your country codes or a list of your, you know, I don't know, code type data uh, is a little more simple. Master data, I, I can see the question because, and I could see the maybe the uh, the temptation for virtualization because I'm a, I say that no, you know, for customer master, for example, nobody owns all of the customer master. And I think some people go wrong by saying, oh yeah, the customer master is your CRM or the customer master is the system. And generally there's a lot of systems that have that customer master, but that's part of the devil in the details, understanding which fields came from where. And I guess you could have that virtual layer across. Um, I think some, if it were very robustly done, yes, um, that makes the subscribe a little harder, I think. Um, into the different systems, and I guess I just get a little twitchy too. Of, of is that was that full analysis done? If yes, you could have that virtual layer, and I if there's ten different attributes of customer, and I know that they're in ten different systems, you've been extreme, and I take one from each. Um, you know, there's there's you know, issues there. If that were completely well thought out, that's fine. Um, I suppose that, that is one approach. I, I just lots of times people. It was that full analysis done, um, and is that the right approach? But I, I'm I am I am biased, I suppose, and that, that is my how I've done it. And it tends to, you could still get it from those different systems, but having that central, I want a list of my master data, and then integrate or push through a 
seems to be how I tend to do it. And the owner with data representation represent a cheaper alternative to combining disparate sources in an incremental data warehouse? Cheaper is, is, is always, uh, to, but yeah, I think a rapid prototype to, to do that. Um, I think over time, if the use case is for a warehouse, doing the inter incremental approach, I think they could fit together, right? I want to understand the use case for the warehouse, or I need some data quickly. But to do, uh, if the use case is for a true data warehouse, doing an inc incremental approach and more of an agile, you know, build it in pieces and deliver it out is probably the proper use case. Um, so, yeah, or is it pay me now, pay me later, right? So, but yeah, it can be a very, especially for rapid prototyping, or I'm, I'm just trying to get, or, or I don't need the full, um, you know, conformed dimensions and, and my, all my history and everything. Warehouse is something else that's used loosely. Is it more of a hub? Is it more of, I, you know, is it a relational warehouse or a true star schema where I want my history over time? If I'm just kind of joining up data version of a warehouse and that truly is the use case, Absolutely, this could be a nice way to do it. So I, I just be careful of, I, I guess when I hear, you know, when people are often, not anyone who asks the question, um, but because this can be seen as easy, are we skipping the analysis phase and did we pick the right use case? But I've also seen people build a warehouse um, that is big and expensive just because they wanted to join up some data that didn't really need a warehouse and it was time consuming and expensive. So I, that was a long-winded way of saying it depends on the use case. Um, but it can be a very quick and easy way to get some data that just, I won't say just, but needs to be joined up for queries, but doesn't truly really need to be mastered or, or warehoused or, or really integrated in that way. And that could be a long-term use case. It doesn't have to be just be a prototype, but it is also a very good use case for a prototype. And can data virtualization be used to cache? Reference data locally managed centrally by multinational enterprises. Wait, I need to think that one through. So that was, what was it, cast locally and managed? Excuse me again? I feel like that was like a quick yeah. question. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. cast, cast locally managed centrally, yeah, by a multinational enterprise. Um, I think I, I do feel like this is one of those quiz questions where there's a trick in it. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it depends what the reference data is. It could be that the question person was getting at sort of the, the pro, you know, often with the governance and security where that data is stored. So if it's truly reference data, what's the ISO country codes? I, I, unless I'm missing something, I don't see necessarily a problem with that. If it's, cust if it's truly master data, and it's customer data and the person is caching it in a country where you know it's it's European data and I'm now taking it here in the US um, and it's living quote in Europe, then that's I think more problematic. Uh, but that would be master data, not reference data. But yeah, that would that would be I, I think that would be a consideration of where that data lives is where that data lives. And I I'm not an auditor uh, or a lawyer, but I would think that it might be a tricky way. It's not a tricky way to get around that requirement, um, but I do think you need to be careful yeah, where that data, if that was what the question meant. But I think if it's just truly reference data, you know, what's a list of uh, valid colors for my shirts that we're selling, I, I can't see that be a problem, but uh, more master data it may be. And Donna, can you elaborate on the real-time aspect of data virtualization since all the data remains in the source? Because well, it remains in, in the source. So I, I guess, um, and because real-time came up before, but if I'm, I'm thinking of, um, okay, so if I'm, if I'm trying to get it into a warehouse, in general I do a source system and I, there's some sort of transformation and movement on that and, and often there is sort of a batch approach because you're, you are doing that analysis. Also, you are trying to, you may get this data at different times um, and, and you want to make sure you pause and integrate that all at one time, right? I might get one at noon and one at five and, and you want to kind of make sure that it's, it's loaded at a certain time. More with the data virtualization, if, if you are just querying it, um, you, you could get that real time. So I want to know what the weather is now from the weather API. Someone had asked about APIs, right? So you could kind of get that through the virtualization layer, um, and you're 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 just you're you're querying it more of a 
real time or at the source. You're not sort of batching it and then uploading it later. So it's sort of more of a direct query against the source. Or I'm, I'm, I'm doing the query now. Um, that makes sense. So <laughs> data virtualization technology is leveraged to spin off virtualized database um, or masked instances, especially like dev, test, or is that a separate topic by itself? Um, I, I, you broke up when you said the beginning of it. Could you repeat that? Sorry. Sure. Uh, can data virtualization technology be leveraged to spin off vis uh, virtualized database or masked instances, especially like dev, test, or is it a separate topic by itself? I'm thinking that's a different topic. I, I'm thinking that sounds like more of a virtual machine, or a, but not a data virtualization layer, which I see as more of a query layer. Um, but I might be misunderstanding the question. And if I'm not, then I don't know the answer. <laughs> but that's how I would see it. That, that there's a lot of words of virtual, and I, I kind of see that as like a VM. I'm spinning up a VM, you know, which is kind of a, a different thing. And that might be more of your uh, different environments you're talking about. So we talked a little bit about cloud, but is uh, data virtualization, is virtualization getting usurped by cloud alternatives that are just as dynamic? Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of that. Could that be the reason for that? I don't know if it's usurped because I'm not sure this totally uh, has been uh, adopted yet. I mean, I, I, I see that maybe as more of the difference between, um, you know, a cloud could be more of a data lake solution in a way. Um, I have to have a picture for everything. Um, I don't have one. Um, oh, it was my first one. Yeah, I mean, you, I kind of see a cloud as, I mean, a lot of these cloud solutions, you have a lot of these things in that, in that platform right there. So, right, I can, I can have kind of a, a data lake in the cloud and a data warehouse component in the cloud and some real-time streaming components in the cloud. Um, yeah, I mean, it might be, I guess, what's getting at that question is, is moving data is, is becoming easier or you don't have to move it because it's all consolidated with the different areas. Um, yeah, that could be a, a, a reason why um, this isn't taking off. But I, I don't know, I do see it as a different thing or you can virtualize across clouds. But um, yeah, it's an interesting point. I'll give that one more thought. I don't, I don't have anything more on that one, but that was clever. <laughs> uh, I love all these questions coming in. Um, can there be persistence and read-write access to data sources or just read access to the data virtualization layer? I generally see it as read access. Um, yeah, I, I usually see it, the uses of I'm, I'm trying to virtualize for the query, um, which is different than more of an API. Someone had asked about APIs, you know, to kind of do a read-write put type of thing. And does, uh, I just lost my, I just lost my <laughs> question. Um, there's a lot of questions in here about product, but of course, we, just so you guys know, we don't, we don't make recommendations about products. We'll, we'll review products on data diversity with pros and cons of that individual product, but we don't recommend one. I over. do, I never ask, and they always ask, but I will, I will just say a generic thing. Um, it seemed in the day, in the past, there were there were a lot of kind of pure play data virtualization tools. There's at least one out there that is just a virtual. But I would say if you're looking at vendors, a lot of the data integration vendors have kind of bought up some of these tools. And um, often it's the, the vendors that may also offer just ETL and or MDM and or a lot of these other solutions. So they, I think that's a good thing because then you kind of have all the tools in the toolkit, <laughs> whether it's the fit, best of breed. Um, but you do, you don't have to necessarily say, if I've you know, bought into only data virtualization, you're kind of stuck. But a lot of the vendors have a lot of these tools in the toolkit, so you can kind of easily mix and match in your same vendor. Which is so awesome. And, and, and Gartner does have their magic water and of data integration, and they talk a bit about this. Um, so you might want to look up that as well. As well as the data diversity roadshow, I'm sorry, I didn't want to, <laughs> then you get to see them in action and not just read a report, so. Yes, demo day, new demo day. Demo day. Um, do you have any experience using data virtualization with Data Vault, um, creating a virtual layer over Data Vault to quickly deliver data sets, even data marts? 
Yeah, I think I touched on that with the warehouse. Um, I, I have not, um, but I can't see why that wouldn't. I mean, to me, that's similar to integrating if, if Vault is a sort of a data warehouse style, um, whether it's more agile or, you know, we could go into Data Vault. But I, I think there's no reason you couldn't. I personally have not, um, but I think it's the same thing. If this data warehouse were kind of a Vault style warehouse, I, I could see that being in this case, but I personally have not. And there was a question in here, if anyone, uh, no, it's not a bad question, I was just looking more for the attendees to answer. If, if, has anyone ha on this call implemented data virtualization and how hard was the quote unquote magic building the APIs and views for the, for the data virtualization um, front end? Uh, John, if you have a quick answer to that, and anybody wants to add their comments in the chat of their experience. I think that's a great question because I, I, I was trying to ask that as well. I'd be curious on this call, given that if you look at all the industry kind of trends, it sounds like it has not been, you know, a lot of folks don't use it. Um, I, I'd be curious if anyone did want to kind of ch chime out and say, hey, yeah, I'm, I can use it and it's great. I'd be curious for the chat. We'll give people a chance to chime in there. Um, Just when we talked about it, does the technology support MPP caching to further enhance performance? Um, I think that would um, depend on each of the vendors. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. <laughs> so that's quite okay. Um, thinking out loud, could a uh, feasible evolution to per B, to persist source data in an immutable data lake store with full transaction history and enhance their data virtualization layer software to provide a virtual dimensional model over the, over the lake source? Wow. Let me think that through. Uh, so the lake source, I guess, if it had structured data in the lake. That seems odd to me. I, I'm just trying to think that through rather than I, I would see more typically I, I have I have not done that um, uh, we would typically I would think take use almost the lake if that were the use case almost use the lake as a landing area or you know and and, and then from there sort of transfer that and if you really wanted the full dimensional warehouse that seems like that would be a more traditional approach that I've used but I, if anyone's in the calls have done that that seems strange to me but I I might not be understanding the full use case of that, but yeah, I, I, I would have thought that the lake would have been more of a, you know, kind of a landing, and then you would take that and kind of conform that into more of a, a warehouse with your dimensions. Because you'd need some sort of transformation on that, and I think there would be a lot of, yeah, that that's, it seems like that would be a more feasible solution, but unless there's something out there I'm missing. I will let the person chime in if they want to add anything. Um, I think we have time to slip in one more question here, Donna. Uh, data virtualization seems like a very flexible way to introduce new and different functionality to in, in indecisive users or a way to reduce a full cost commitment for exploring the whims of a demand user. What do you think? <laughs> Sounds like someone having trouble with their users. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if if you're just kind, of, it is a good way to rapidly prototype before you commit. And, and again, I don't know if they're problematic users or the use case is problematic, right? I mean, people, we don't know the answer until we've had a chance to look at it. Um, in that case, this can be very valuable before, you know, kind of, I, I don't know what's out there. I can do, you know, in a way, I think someone mentioned some of these cloud platforms and, and data lakes can do a bit of that. Um, but this data virtualization can also, without having to move anything to do that, it can be a nice way to kind of even see what's out there, see what it would make sense to integrate. And then if there's a use case for doing something more, you know, integrated like a, like a warehouse, um, then that's a nice way to prototype without having to make that commitment and, and do a lot of work. So, I mean, not that there's no work, but <laughs> so I think that makes sense. All right, uh, well, that is all the time. I'll see you guys.
Uh, and thank you so much for uh, all the great questions that have come in and a great discussion uh, time. Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, the recording, and of course to the new research paper. Uh, and Donna, thank you so much for this. Thanks everybody. Hope you all uh, have a great day and stay safe out there. Great, thanks everyone. Thanks.